Good morning. It's time to get started. We like to do things promptly here. No fooling around. My name is Matthew Beatham. I'm the Vice Chair of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. And I'm here to welcome you today to the first of the semester Arts and Humanities Colloquium. And there'll be two more to follow, as many of you know. <laughs> as a young girl, Marnie Stanley sported a hairstyle emblematic of her unorthodox approach to life and academe. Growing up at Township 60, Range 47, southwest quarter of nine, west of the fourth, in Hazel Bluff, Alberta, with two parents, five siblings, no running water, and no Barbie dolls, abandoned in the Alberta grasslands for hours each summer, Marnie learned to embrace nature. Thus, her winter pastimes included playing with frozen dead weasels, which she tossed into the nearest snowbank whenever they became limp. <laughs> Indoors, in what we might now dub Harry Potter fashion, Marnie designed a makeshift bedroom in the crawl space under the eaves of the attic. Here, by the light of a single bulb, Marnie read and reread her influential collection of scholastic books. Despite these modest beginnings, Marnie became a celebrity of sorts. In fact, her exploits were regularly featured in the local press. In 1981, the Hazel Bluff News reported that Marnie traveled to London, where she attended 14 different operettas and plays. Gone were the days of having to stage the same play over and over again with frozen weasels. <laughs> In 1982, the Westlock News proudly reported, Marnie Stanley will be traveling to England this fall on a Commonwealth scholarship to study at the world famous Oxford University. The reporter with great enthusiasm and unfortunate na naivete explained that Marnie would achieve her Doctor of Philosophy in one year. <laughs> Eight years later, Marnie's return to Canada resulted in yet another featured news story, this time in the Westlock Hub. Here we learn that Marnie, Oxford doctoral degree in hand, has been hired by the University of British Columbia. It can be quite a snobby university, declares Marnie. Of course, I'm, as I'm sure you understand, this remark refers to Oxford, not UBC. <laughs> After a year as a sessional instructor in Vancouver, most fortunately for us, Marnie chose to pursue her full-time career at an institution more amenable to her non-canonical pursuits. Here in the English department, Marnie has been encouraged by our department chair to explore, discover, and cast spells. <laughs> Shortly after her arrival in Nanaimo, Marnie ventured on holiday back to Alberta where small mammals once again played a role in her professional development. Thanks to this trip and a museum filled with dead gophers poised in tableau, one of Marnie's holiday photographs was subsequently published in the renowned British newspaper, The Independent on Sunday. Ten years later, under the influence of a colleague who has chosen to remain anonymous, Marnie abandoned her study of lifeless rodents to investigate the living dead. Thus began her academic interest in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, initially manifesting in the co-written paper, Queer Eye of That Vampire Guy, Spike in the Aesthetics of Camp. Let's face it, writes Marnie, either you find the series basic premise that a miniskirt clad teenage girl named Buffy fights vampires camp, or you don't. The paper's nomination for the prestigious Mr. Pointy Award encouraged Marnie to continue her academic work in Buffy studies, most recently on the comic book series Buffy Season 8. Last year, Marnie's autobiographical essay for Crying Out Loud was published in the book On the Verge of Tears, Why the Movies, Television, Music, Art, Popular Culture, Literature, and the Real World Make Us Cry. Marnie's contribution to this collection recounts, among other tearful memories, her reaction to a film that only Temple Grandin and Marnie could love. And I quote, when I was a child of 12, I saw a film called Rare Breed about a lone Hereford Bull vindicator by name brought to America to improve the quality of the hardy but apparently not very tasty Texas Longhorn. 
When he immigrates to America from England, he's much mocked for his red hair and passive temperament. He dies in a blizzard his first winter in the New World. In the spring, the prairie is littered with short, stocky, red-haired calves. Vindicator is vindicated. Of course, I wept buckets when they scraped the snow aside to reveal his frozen flank. I've never seen it again, why would anyone? But it remains in my memory one of the great weepies of my childhood. A plucky animal in peril, plus a young girl who believed in him. It was like black beauty without any of that pretty girly horsey stuff. Anyone can be moved by the beauty of a horse. They're majestic and have killer eyelashes and manes to toss. But it takes a truly sensitive soul to be moved to sobbing by a frozen side of a Hereford bull. <laughs> and now, for our feature presentation, Graphic Matters Women Making Comics, please welcome the sometimes tearful, often humorous, and always extraordinarily creative, my friend and colleague, Dr. Marnie Stanley. Well, thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> So now everybody knows everything <clears throat> about my sordid past in rural Alberta. Um, so my talk today has a very simple thesis, and that is that women make comics worth reading and on a wide range of subjects. And that may seem self-evident, <laughs> but it isn't. And the inspiration comes from this particular uh, book, which is on my shelf in my office, uh, published by Yale University Press, Masters of American Comics. And when I bought it, I should have realized they meant the title literally. It was, uh, it's a big sort of coffee table book that went with an exhibition that traveled in America, and it's only about men. So it treats the comic industry as completely masculine. And although it's dominated by men, it isn't, and it hasn't been historically, at least for all of uh, the 20th century there were women working in comics and the genre doesn't really go back uh, much further than the 20th century. I'd also like to thank the comic historian Trina Robbins, who's a comic art her artist herself, and you will see one of her uh, drawings in this presentation, for her work on trying to keep some of the early figures in women's comics in print. Without her uh, collections of historic comics by women, it would be very hard to access any of these works. So for all of the uh, images pre-1950, most of them come from her collections uh, looking back over women's comics. So early uh, comics by women, those uh, that began in the industry before World War I, are dominated by two themes, fashion and babies. And it's that uh, preponderance of the feminine in their work that I think made their work acceptable and allowed them to begin to get published. One of those figures was Rose O'Neill, who was a successful graphic artist, uh, born at the end of the 19th century. She was working professionally by 1910 uh, and she had a strip that ran for over 20 years called the Cupies and this is an ad that ran in Good Housekeeping magazine, one of the many magazines and newspapers that ran the Cupies, announcing their arrival. And the little Cupie dolls uh, were also manufactured. In fact, my aunt and uncle in, in Chilliwack, uh, who will be married 70 years this year, had little porcelain cupies as the bride and groom on the top of their wedding cake, which they still have. And I, I had cupie dolls in my own childhood, so they, they lasted as a, uh, as a production for many years past her death. She also was a successful commercial artist. Here's an ad uh, for Jello from the teens. And here's a page of her strip. So you can see that the Cupies were sort of little round toddler babies and the uh, cartoon is very much about cuteness. But it's not about family life, or there's no domesticity. The Cupies sort of exist in a world of their own without adults. And there's a little bit of sort of magic fairyland kind of feel to the comic as a whole but very commercially successful and long-running. 
Another important figure is Grace Drayton, who did uh, Dolly Dingle and Dolly Dimple and all sorts of other strips and mini paper dolls. And again, I had Grace Drayton paper dolls in my own childhood. Uh, they stayed in print for a very long time, and she was also a successful commercial artist. And most famously, she did the Campbell's Soup Kids, which she did until her death. And, and then Campbell's Soup continued on uh, with versions of them for some time thereafter. And these women worked in the tradition of other uh, artists like Margaret Hayes, who was actually Drayton's sister, who also had her own comic strips and her own commercial art practice. And uh, other f figures of the period like Maud Humphrey, who was Humphrey Bogart's mother. Uh, Humphrey Bogart was a baby model for baby food in his infancy. And his mother was one of the great uh, late 19th century American children's illustrators. Uh, I'm more interested personally in the other line of women's comics, which are the ones that were obsessed with fashion. And I'm just beginning work on a paper uh, looking at fashion as fetishism in early women's comics. And one of the great artists of that is Nell Brinkley, very fashionable herself, as you can see in these pictures from 1913. And uh, one of the first women to license her name uh, on products uh, for her art, so other than an actress. Um, and she especially was associated with hair products. And she drew hair uh, with great precision. This is one of her comic characters um, known as Golden Eyes. And Golden Eyes is accompanied always by a Cupid who stands in for a child and her dog uh, named Uncle Sam. And this strip ran through World War I, or a portion of World War I, and Golden Eyes goes off to Europe to follow her man Bill. And she becomes a sort of Mata Hari type spy. There's a lovely uh, sequence where you see a German officer who she has uh, seduced, and he wakes up with a candle on his chest and his tunic open and his plans gone, which she takes off to the other side and rescues Bill. She becomes a Red Cross nurse in a costume which could not possibly be worn by an actual nurse. It's so frothy. Um, but Brinkley loved uh, the extravagance of fashion, and it comes through very strongly in her work, which is full of these amazing draperies, uh, amazing hair. And don't you just love this swimming hat with fins? <laughs> A bathing costume so beautiful that it can be turned into an evening ensemble with the addition of a coat, right? Um, hat and all. And you can see how she got associated with hair products from the extraordinary detail of these, uh, the way she draws hair, which is very much like her own hair uh, style. But the thing that interests me about the extreme fashion of artists like Brinkley and Messick and uh, Mills, who you'll see in a second, is that fashion on the one hand, high fashion as opposed to just the clothes we wear for practical reasons, is a commodity which hides its use value. Uh, camouflages it almost completely, really, high fashion. And in a way, these early artists are camouflaging the use value of their characters. In other words, the women's agency, their actions, their, her their heroism, and so on, is kind of hidden under all of this extravagant fashion. And at the same time, fashion is associated with transformation, right? We don different kinds of garments for different kinds of work and so on. And that also is part of the uh, meaning they give to fashion as their their women take on different roles. Here's one of her characters, Dimples, and in this, Dimples uh, is imagining that she ends up president of the United States in this smashing ensemble, uh, which both sort of uh, pays homage to the Fathers of Confederation and also lots and lots and lots of ruffles. And at the end the text says, how about a gal where Cal is now? So replace Calvin Coolidge with a gal. Um, and she allows herself these kinds of extravagant fantasies of serious transformation for women. And of course working as she was in the teens and through the 20s and into the 30s, 
she's working through a period of, on the one hand, increased consumption and commodity fetishism in her culture, but on the other hand, a time also of great transformation for women. And Brinkley was a suffragette. She did some beautiful art uh, for the suffrage movement, which she manages to make look patriotic. I couldn't find um, an image that I could uh, reproduce of her most famous suffrage image, but it it sort of uh, plays on the patriotic images that she used to sell liberty bonds and so on, but supports women's suffrage. So she's using fashion then, we could argue, to both highlight women's femininity, but also to destabilize it by using it as an image also of transformation. She also did fashion cartooning for the newspapers, so here's a, a little cartoon about the difficulty of getting into a sheath dress that has no buttons, right, that simply pulls on, and the gymnastics required. And here's one of the ads drawn by her for the hair products, uh, so she did both these curlers, uh, and they, were, they had her name on them, and also uh, shampoos were sold with her licensing. And she also had a Nell Brinkley song in the Follies, the Zigfield Follies, and the Brinkley Girl, uh, which was the name of the song, the Nell Brinkley Girl, became the sort of replacement for the Gibson girl that had immediately preceded it of Charles Nana Gibson. But if you look at the difference between their arts, uh, Gibson's cartoons of women are of uh, stiff and cold and frozen-hearted women always looking down their noses and breaking men's hearts. Whereas Brinkley's women are active. She was fascinated by flight. She had flown by 1914, which not very many people had flown. She um, did drawings of women aviatrixes as they were known at the time. She did uh, drawings of women war workers in World War I and series of drawings of women uh, heroines of various kinds including members of the Russian army and so on. So she was very interested in women's active agency but always with this kind of layers of froth uh, that, that um, sort of took away or made less dangerous you could say their, their actions. The next really important, uh, and she had many followers, so Gladys Parker and all of the other sort of flapper comic writers were all uh, very derivative of her work. The next great figure in women's comics is Tarpe Mills, or in my sort of pantheon anyway. <laughs> um, and she invented the character uh, Miss Fury, who was first known as Dark Fury. And she is the first female action comic predating Wonder Woman by a year. And Miss Fury lived in South America and fought uh, Nazis, basically. So here's her original um, opening frame for the series while well, it was still called Black Fury, which it was for the first few weeks. And it was a Sunday uh, color comic telling the stories of uh, her characters' uh, battles with various enemies and often with this giant white Persian cat. And she liked Persian cats and, and even entered them in competitions and so on, Tarpe Mills herself. So they uh, feature highly in her work. Here's the ad that came out uh, in the newspapers to announce that um, they were syndicating the series. And syndication, of course, is very important for livelihood, right, to give people uh, enough work. And you can see that she's in very good papers, like the Chicago Sun, the Boston Globe, and so on. So it was, a, it was a, not in sort of minor newspapers, it was in majors. So here's a strip, um, the bad guy uh, with the white streak in his hair is about to uh, execute this little heir to somebody's fortune so that he can um, embezzle the money. And he's practicing his evil means by dissolving a rabbit in acid. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I love about, so here is our, our uh, heroine and I love the practicality of this. She carries her superhero uh, costume in a suitcase, right? I mean, none of the men, you never know where the men keep their stuff, right? You don't see Batman or Spider-Man. I mean, Batman gets dressed, I guess, in his lair, and Superman spins around in phone booths, but I don't know how that works. But she carries hers in a suitcase. 
and just because she's in this lovely little suit and hat and so there's no reason she can't get into her cat suit uh, very quickly so the the narrative is that she has a suit made out of the skin of a black jaguar that gives her powers right? and so off she goes to rescue the orphan or well soon to be executed child and having rescued him she turns him over to the authorities. She wants to adopt him, but I love, I love this ensemble that she wears to go to that age. This hat, I mean, it is spectacular. Look at this. Um, and they tell her that since she's not a citizen of this nation, uh, that she can't adopt him and he will have to go to an orphanage. But of course that all will be resolved. And here is the Baroness, uh, her main rival in both fashion and uh, politics. And the Baroness uh, is equally slim, equally beautiful, equally wealthy, and able to dress spectacularly. And there's a number of sequences that take place in fashion stores and so on where they try on clothes, which allows males to get even more outfits into a strip. And I love the Baroness's uh, dress with a white peacock on the front, representing, of course, her vanity. This particular strip, this specific page, got her in trouble and lost her some of her syndication. Her representation of one of the bad girls, uh, Era is her name, who's a nightclub performer and spy. Um, was censored by a number of papers. Some papers printed a red dress over top of her outfit and some papers actually cancelled their syndication as a consequence. And the whole history of what gets censored in comics of course is interesting too. Here's Era, uh, one of the bad women in the strip, demonstrating that just because you're wearing a very nice suit with a pencil skirt doesn't mean you A, can't carry bodies or B, uh, pistol whip a man into submission <laughs> without getting so much as a hair out of place, you'll notice in the... All this obsession with fashion meant, of course, that a lot of these early artists did paper dolls, even the ones who did babies, as we saw with Grace uh, Drayton's paper dolls. And the association of women's comics with paper dolls has become so cliche that now you're most likely, many women artists still do them occasionally and with the most unlikely characters. So that in the 70s underground comic movement, um, Trina Robbins, who's that comic historian that I mentioned earlier, was able to do uh, paper dolls as additions to her Hetty the Hooker. Uh, comic. So Hetty comes with Fredericks of Hollywood style um, paper dolls in the tradition established by previous artists. Another great fashion comic artist is Dale Messick. This is the longest running strip by a woman. I think Lynn Johnson is approaching sort of uh, with her better, for better or worse, is, is approaching um, Messick's record. But Brenda Starr was launched in 1940, I think it is, or 41, and ran until the mid 80s. So incredibly long running strip. And it's Brenda Starr reporter, so she starts off on the page, you know, doing nothing but uh, obituaries and lifestyle things and eventually becomes a sort of investigative reporter and has a life rich in adventure. And here she is in 1960 uh, on a Polynesian island with her sort of main romantic figure, this guy, Basil St. John, uh, who wears a pirate patch. Um, and also, of course, is you can imagine there were many, many, many Brenda Starr uh, paper dolls. This is a strip by Jackie Orms, and Jackie Orms is the first black American woman to have a comic strip, and the first for a very long time. In other words, there wasn't another one uh, until Barbara Brandon in 1989. And Jackie Orms first invented this character, Torchy, um, in Heartbeats uh, in the 30s, but it didn't, didn't sell in the late 30s. So instead she did a character called Patty Jo that was a little girl with a big sister and the, it was a single frame comic and it consisted of Patty Jo saying sort of 
childwardly wisdom things while her big sister kind of looked on. And the big sister became the sort of fashion uh, icon in that comic that, that had paper dolls and so on. But Patty Jo had a real doll and was one of the first black dolls designed by a black uh, artist and is now highly collected uh, by black doll collectors for, the, for that reason. Because it tried to depart from the sort of uh, little black sambo and um, golly and other sort of cliche and stereotypical black toys of the time. So this strip is from the 50s, uh, which was the main decade. So it was relaunched, uh, Torchy was relaunched in 1950 and ran until 1957 when Orms retired. The next uh, sort of era I want to touch on is the underground comic movement, which began in the very late 60s. Um, if you're a comic fan, you're probably associated with comics like Raw uh, and Zap and artists like Spiegelman and Crumb. And there were quite a few women also working in that genre. So this is Dory Sita. Um, Sita died very young in her 30s of a lung condition. And so uh, her work, although very good, is not as extensive as some of the other artists. And here's her comic about how much her family is embarrassed by the fact that she makes comics for a living. And her mother's always worried that she's broke. Her comics are very much about living in the Mission District of San Francisco uh, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, in this one, her, her relatives are all slightly embarrassed um, by her career. And in the end, her brother sort of says to her niece, don't draw, you'll end up like your crazy aunt. <laughs> Dory. And when she died so young, um, her mother inherited the rights to her comics and she censored them because Sita was very frank about sexuality and issues like that in her comics and um, her mother uh, was embarrassed by them and so she simply locked them up and they were not in print for a very long time. And finally, her, some of her friends did a court case to challenge um, that authority because she had written a, a will when she was dying but it wasn't a proper legal will but it was witnessed and so on and eventually they won and her comics were reprinted in the early 90s. Another key figure is Mary Fleener who started out making little tiny mini comics uh, illustrating works by other writers in the uh, very early 80s and late 70s and then she started to write her own comics. She wrote the comic series um, published in the sort of standard floppies uh, called Slutburger and um, here she refers to herself up at the top as Mary you can't make this stuff up Fleener <laughs> and this is about a conversation with her mother she's going to be in one of the first compilations of women's underground comics which is a comic called tits and clits and she's trying to explain it to her mother and her mother hears cliques and says oh it's going to be called tits and cliques and she says no clits and then they get in this whole conversation <laughs> and finally her mother says oh you say Clitoris, I say clitoris, no wonder I didn't know. And then her mother starts singing the old Cole Porter song. <laughs> you say potato and I say potato. <laughs> and so by the end she's like, oh my God. So you can't make this stuff up, she's right. One of the great things about the underground comic movement is it uh, introduced the whole idea of autobiographical comics um, in the work of women, but also in the in the work of men like Crumb and Spiegelman, who I mentioned already, and uh, just telling your own your own stories. And one of my favorite genres of comics, whether by men or women, is the autobiographical. And there's a great many wonderful artists working in that field. And I thought I would show you some of my favorites. So here's Linda Berry, and Berry works also in fiction. Um, she wrote uh, Cruddy, and she did the series uh, about a family with uh, Marley's and Freddie and so on called Ernie Pook's Comic, which ran for a long time in the Georgia Strait, so you may be familiar with it from that. This is from A Hundred Demons. Um, this is a book I love to teach and she took her inspiration from a Zen uh, monk's um, scroll called A Hundred Demons and the idea of the demons is those things which haunt us uh, in our lives, those things which we can't get out of our heads, uh, incidents, things we did that were stupid or unforgivable or things people did to us. 
and she invites her readers to do their own demons and gives some advice about how to do that at the end. She works on yellow legal, lined legal paper. You can see the lines uh, through very cheap paper. She works uh, with cheap watercolors and ink. She uses Chinese block ink. And she makes uh, these wonderful comics. This is from one of the demons. It's called Magic and it's remembering a, a friend that she sort of threw away because she felt embarrassed to have a friend younger than herself when she was a young teenager. Her texts are quite writerly uh, so that she tends to have quite long blocks of conversation or narration on her comics and then these very simple and evocative drawings. And even though her style seems quite childish in some ways, she can deal with very, very serious subject matter. Here she is at work on her yellow legal paper in her pajamas, <laughs> it's her preferred working style. Here's the title page of one of the demons uh, called Head Lice. And you can see how she works uh, this very handcrafted looking style and I've seen these, they had some of these pages in the crazy exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery a couple years ago and they're very dimensional because she glues you know fabric flowers and beads and puts glitter and origami and old greeting cards and all kinds of things into these title pages and her different pages of her book are hand colored with with plaids in watercolor and so on. So it's a very sort of scrapbooky, handcrafted, even girly kind of uh, nature to the work which plays on again that idea the sort of feminine that removes or, or slightly um, distracts you from the seriousness of the content because it's a book that deals with issues like uh, child sex abuse, uh, drug problems, uh, suicide, um, all kinds of uh, domestic violence, all kinds of very serious subjects. So there's a kind of um, almost camouflage to the surface of the book from the content in the same way that fashion functioned in those earlier works. This is Ariel Schrag. Ariel Schrag is an American who started publishing comics when she was in high school. This is from the second volume of her three volume, uh, which all together add up to about 800 pages, uh, comics documenting her high school. This is from the middle volume, Potential, which is my favorite. And um, she's gone on to be a writer for various HBO series and so on. Not presently making comics very much, although she's working on an animated film of this volume. Uh, of her high school chronicles and she started selling them as little floppies um, going to comic festivals and so on and now they've been collected into a lovely sort of big edition by a mainstream press. In this particular comic uh, Ariel and uh, a high school girlfriend are talking to the art teacher about what sex uh, consists of and there's a lovely moment where the teacher <laughs> says don't you know uh, you know whether whether you've had an orgasm basically and then this lovely look of their eyes um, trying to decide whether they know or not <laughs> <laughs> and in the first two volumes especially she really captures I think the the sort of struggles of that age group. She worked on the last volume for a very long time, so she worked on it until she was in her mid-twenties, so it, it kind of distances itself a little more um, from the age, I think. This is Alison Bechtel. Uh, Bechtel's known also for her comic strip, Dykes to Watch Out For, which is a very political strip. Uh, this is her autobiography, Fun Home, in which she looks at her childhood in a, her father was a high school teacher and funeral home director, so they lived in the funeral home for the community with the mortuary in the basement. Um, and I like this, this particular page, she looks at the the symmetry, I mean the perfectly balanced symmetry of the page and the asymmetries between her and her father who is a repressed homosexual partly because of his, the period of his life, uh, it was illegal and so on and she is going to be as she grows up an out homosexual and so this kind of list of contrasts between them um, that she investigates in this, in this perfectly symmetrical page about their asymmetries. In this page, she uses a, a kind of movie technique, moment to moment, as if it was frames of a film, 
for this exchange where they finally, as, a, as she's now an adult and coming out, tries to talk to him about his life and she wants it to be, and the book is full of references to literature, a lot of Proust, uh, a lot of James Joyce, Joyce especially, and uh, via Joyce to the uh, story of the Odyssey. And she wants it to be this great mythic moment where they're finally able to be honest with each other, but it doesn't happen. It, it remains this kind of very stagnant, uh, sort of everyday thing. But she talks, especially in this section of the text, about wishing that it could be like uh, the Odyssey or like um, some great moment in literature, but instead it's just kind of embarrassing and not very uh, rewarding emotionally. But the very stagnant sort of nature of the images helps support that. She's a very, very skilled artist, very detailed. She photographs uh, compulsively sort of everything for her um, drawing for accuracy and so on. Here is uh, Zena Abirshad, and I put this in, even though this book isn't yet available in English, I hope very much that it will be translated. Uh, Abirshad is doing a autobiographical account of her uh, experience of the Lebanese war, um, living in Beirut through that conflict. And I love her art. It's very, very beautiful. I love these sort of anxiety of these two smokers on the telephone and the smoke just kind of completely begins to obliterate. Um, but it demonstrates also their tension and, and their, what is doing that? <laughs> and their uh, sort of level of anxiety under which they live. And again, that she can use a very static and repeated image and still create that, that sensibility. So I'm very much hoping that this will appear in English. This is uh, Persua Bashi from 2009. This is Nylon Road. And it's about growing up in Iran um, and the difficulties of growing up after the revolution in a very uh, repressive regime for women. And we get that very uh, visually demonstrated by this uh, man who is pursuing her for marriage, sort of drowning her in his need. It reminds me of the, the wonderful scene at the end of To the Lighthouse of Lily Briscoe, feeling that Mr. Ramsey's need is kind of washing over and she has to lift her skirt out of the way to, to get away from it. Um, so she uses all these rich visual metaphors uh, to talk, but it's also very realistic in other places where she's disciplined by the, by the women's committee. Uh, she's thrashed, whipped, literally, for, for uh, stepping out of line. And it really conveys very strongly the, the great difficulty of growing up with these very altered expectations because of the revolution that had so changed her nation. One of the things that really interests me about women's comics is we don't think of women as making war comics, and yet they do, but they make them about the domestic consequences of war, the consequences to families, the psychological consequences. They're not, in a sense, uh, action comics. So when you look at somebody like Abir Shad or Bashi, or here's Carol Tyler, a uh, wonderful American comic artist. This is from her trilogy called You'll Never Know, which tries to deal with... Uh, what what happened in her own life because of her father's experience of the war. So her father was a soldier in World War II. Her husband's father, she was married to the uh, comic artist Justin Green. Um, both of them had fathers who were very traumatized by the war, which led to issues of violence and, and fear in their childhoods, which comes out then in their understanding of family and their relationships. And her father won't talk about the war for a very long time, but then late in life, he suddenly phones her up and starts talking about this battle in Italy and the rivers of blood. And she's completely overwhelmed by his sort of pouring out of all of this uh, fear and anger. And she tries to sort of, but when she tries to talk to him about it, he just says, war's got nothing to do with it. I'm just an ornery bastard. And so the trilogy, of which only two volumes are completed, so I don't know how it's going to end, um, deals with the repercussions for her, but also for her daughter, who, who develops mental illness. And so in this uh, panel from, or page from the second volume, she confronts Hitler, this imaginary sort of Hitler, 
and says, you know, get out of my family, right? You can't mess with him. The next page, it's just daughter screamed across the, the page as her daughter is sort of being carried off um, to the psych ward because she knows that it's all linked up, right? All linked up in these very troubled family dynamics. Miriam Caton's beautiful uh, comic, penciled comic, We Were On Our Own, deals with her uh, flight with her mother from Hungary, from Budapest in World War II, and all the things her mother had to do, uh, including uh, in the, on this pa page, um, basically prostituting herself to a German officer for food and, and so on. And the little girl doesn't understand. She thinks her mother's crying because the man's gone away. But in fact, her mother's crying because the man has visited her. And Caton has written about how when she published this comic just recently, um, her mother was very worried that some of the people in the comic would come and get her. Like She still has this very present fear uh, about um, the war that, that has never uh, dissolved. Right? Many of you will probably know the work of Marjan Satrapi, who has a new book coming out this, uh, this term called Psy. Um, this is from The Complete Persepolis, so this is from volume one. The next slide is from volume two. And again, she deals, this is the Iranian Revolution, but Satrapi's a little bit older than Bashua, so she's living through it, whereas Bashua is kind of born at the end, uh, after it's already. Um, taken place. So Satrapi sort of starts to grow up in one world and then has it very rapidly changed. And on this page she goes off with her nanny to uh, a protest and Satrapi makes wonderful use here of, of kind of the style of tessellation of, of uh, Arab tile art and so on and then comes home to her mother's wrath because her mother knows that all sorts of people were shot that day uh, by the revolutionary forces and has been just sick with worry all day and so she slaps both her daughter and her um, caretaker, her nanny, across the face and so they sit at the end of the page with these marks on their face thinking about how the violence they've suffered is at the hands of their own. Again looking at how uh, these traumatic events of a culture come home to the family, come home to the small domestic sphere. Her parents send her away to Europe because she's so outspoken and they're worried that she's going to um, get in trouble, end up executed. And that's not a success. She's too young, she can't cope, she ends up getting very, very ill, getting um, really bad pneumonia, almost dying, uh, ending up homeless and, and getting sent back. And then she has to sort of lead this, this life. And in this uh, spread, we can see the oppression of the war, the way she uses the kind of ruined buildings, the angles of the architecture to kind of close in over her, but also the sense of all the dead and the sort of guilt of somebody who's not active in the war, who in fact escaped a great deal of it, uh, but who now stands as a sort of um, at least semi-free and functioning person on the bodies of all of their fellow citizens who have died in all the bombings and so on, including one of her best friends from school. Here's Sarah Glidden, uh, a new book just out called How to Understand Israel in 60 Days. And Glidden is an American, who, a Jewish American, who goes to Israel um, in the hopes of kind of understanding what's going on, understanding some of the issues of conflict. And this beautiful, beautifully painted uh, book, in this particular scene, she goes to a talk given by uh, Israeli and Palestinian survivors of um, the conflict who have lost family members. So the ghost figures um, that appear are their lost family members that they talk about and talk about how they died. And it's part of her trying to sort of come to terms with this very complex political situation. And another book that deals with the same material in a very different way uh, is Miriam Lepicki's uh, Jobnik about another American Jewish girl, more religious than Glidden by their own definitions of that, uh, who goes off um, to work in Israel. And, and um, in this particular scene, she's staying with a religious 
a mo uh, quite religious family and the young woman, uh, young Israeli woman is talking to her about modesty and she compliments her dress. Uh, this is the piggy's character here. And she explains how she had to get the bodice filled in because it was too revealing. And of course they're sitting there in their sort of American style uh, wonder bras and scoop neck shirts. And then later when she's in the bathroom, the father walks in on her and she thinks she's not really measuring up on the modesty scales uh, for this family at all. And so both of these texts, Glidden's and Lubicki's, try to sort of uh, put their own um, Jewishness into the context of Israel and the complex uh, issues there. Both very well drawn. This is by the Vancouver artist and writer Sarah Levitt. This is Tangles um, from 2010. And another subject matter that comes up a lot in autobiography is various kinds of difficulty of dealing with um, traumatic events. And Levitt's mother develops very early onset Alzheimer and starts to deteriorate. Uh, in her 50s, quite young in her 50s, and Levitt is only in her early 20s herself and becomes a caretaker. And so the book deals very honestly with the complex relationships that develop in the family around this crisis and all the different decisions in this particular moment in the text uh, is the family dealing with the fact that her mother can't navigate the stairs anymore and starts to just sort of stop and, and panic and just sits on them and, and can't move and the father trying to carry her down but that can't work uh, much longer for safety so the, the parents have to abandon living upstairs and move their, their bedroom down into the living room basically. So a very honest book um, and published uh, by Broadview Press. It's just started a line of comics. They have two in print. Joyce Farmer's Special Exit deals with similar uh, subject matter. A wonderful artist. She was part of the underground movement of the 70s uh, and then sort of retired from comics for a while doing more commercial work but has done this beautiful graphic novel or graphic memoir rather about her parents uh, deaths and the various medical issues and family issues and so on again. Very heartfelt uh, beautiful book. Rosalind Penfold, uh, which is an alias, has done uh, this book called Dragon Slippers. This is what an abusive relationship looks like about domestic abuse. Um, and on this page, she's just discovered that she's accidentally and unintentionally pregnant, which her boyfriend rejoices in, thinking that that will uh, tie her to him. Um, but she has various health reasons and so on for not wanting a child, but he rejects that as being about career and the scene uh, will progress to violence. And it's a very good book about uh, these issues, but a difficult one to read. Leslie Fairfield has uh, written tyranny about her decades long struggle with eating disorders. So this is a woman who struggled with eating disorders for more than 20 years. and she turns her her illness into this character, uh, the tyranny, literally, that rides her back, um, and carries on dialogues with it, trying to sort of figure out uh, what to do and, and how to get literally out from under it. Tracy White, a very young artist, has done this work uh, called How I Made It to 18 about her adolescent uh, stay in a psychiatric institution. And I love the way she uses the dialogue box as a kind of assault. You know, it's like some sort of frog tongue that comes across. And she can do it back, although never with as much uh, text. And then this sort of stalemate, you know, of the two figures, the therapist and the teenager, uh, lock, locking horns. Very effective, simple style that really conveys a lot. Uh, Maria Acacello, who's this, who uh, cartoons sometimes for the New Yorker, so if you're a New Yorker reader you've probably seen her work in single frame cartoons, did Cancer Vixen about her struggle with breast cancer. 
and she glues in a lot of actual documents so she'll glue in uh, diagnostic things or she'll draw needles actual size or she'll glue in receipts for treatment which is truly shocking when you see the American cost of American health care uh, because she's a cartoonist and doesn't have insurance um, and then she has a sort of regular strip technique as well on this page going along the bottom but here's another page from it you see her in a stuck place in her therapy where she's trying to uh, love herself to feel better she feels so much guilt about needing money from family and uh, making everybody upset and all these other and how shallow she's been as a what she calls herself a fashionista which she does she tells you what shoes she wears to every chemo treatment um, so today's Jimmy Choo day you know for chemo number one and stuff uh, and she knows that I mean she's very uh, self-reflective but it's an excellent book Another book on breast cancer is Miriam Engelberg's Cancer Made Me a Shallow Person. And Engelberg, unlike uh, Marchetta, has a, a terminal diagnosis and she knows that from the beginning. So it's a very different book, very um, harsh in some ways, but very, very honest, an excellent book. So I thought we'd look just at the end at a few uh, recommendations for fiction. Uh, Jen uh, Wang's beautiful Coco Be Good, gorgeous book with all these kind of washes of light color about two young people um, sort of just graduating university and trying to figure out the paths of their lives and she subverts the expectation that it will end up a romance between them um, but it's about self-discovery, very nice text. In a very different flavor <laughs> is the great Diane de Massey's Hothead Paisan Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist, um, which ran through the 1990s in, in uh, sort of split comics and has been collected into one giant splendid volume. And uh, Paisan is always accompanied by her cat, Chicken, <laughs> um, who gets mini strips to her or his self. It's never really clear. Um, and here, near the beginning of, this, of the uh, text, which is hundreds and hundreds of pages altogether now that they're collected, um, Paisan is, is sort of getting her inspiration for her uh, revolutionary path from television, right? Watching all this television and it's all grotesque. It's all men with guns and women cleaning and white people buying expensive things. And she flips through all the channels and it's just endlessly stupid and by the end she says, where else on earth can you be offended so many ways in so little time? And she launches her battle against it. And here's one of Chicken's strips um, where Chicken is dissatisfied because Paisan's off doing something revolutionary and calls on buddies, Boogums and Henry and off they go, the friends at the end, um, for some cat adventure. So she mixes these kinds of radical feminist comics in with these cat comics um, for a lighter relief. This is Debbie Dreschler. Uh, Dreschler uh, teaches art in an American university. She's a brilliant comic artist. This is from Daddy's Girl, um, which is a tough comic that deals with child abuse very frankly um, and explicitly, but also de deals very beautifully with uh, friendship between girls and the strength that can come from that. This is the wonderful Canadian comic artist Julie Doucet who's retired from comics I'm sad to say because she couldn't make a living. Um, but this is from Lève ta jambe, mon poisson et moi. <laughs> Lift your leg, my fish is dead. Um, and in, in the English title it's in French and in the French title it's in English. Um, and she's published ex extensively by Drawn and Quarterly which is Canada's best comic uh, publishing house in Quebec, in Montreal. And in this comic, uh, her character has dropped a tab of acid and is having this psychedelic trip and is all thrilled, uh, it's so fabulous, and then discovers that the flowers that she's seeing are the ones on Kotex pads, and that's, that's a real bummer um, when you think you're having a fabulous psychedelic trip. And that's very typical of Doucet's sense of humor, uh, but she has this wonderful, wonderful visual style, very rich very detailed. Her comics take a lot of time, a lot of her comics anyway, both to produce and to look at. 
Another Canadian artist, Leanne Franson, uh, originally from Regina, now living in Montreal. Uh, she publishes a lot of little teeny comics. I ordered some from her online. She publishes her comics free on the web as well. And she put little hand drawings on every single one that she sent me <laughs> um, and said, okay, I'm a procrastinator. I've wasted a lot of time. <laughs> um, this is uh, Gabriella Jandali. I just love the art in this book. This is Interiori, published by Fantagraphics in Seattle. It's about an apartment building and the people that live in the apartment building and their, their lives, their romances and sorrows and so on, as witnessed by this very thoughtful and philosophical rabbit who thinks about um, you know, what a rabbit heart can take. And, and uh, it's just a beautiful, rich and beautiful book. Phoebe Gluckner, another tough comic artist, uh, sort of roughly contemporary with Dory Seda and uh, Debbie Dreschler. This is a Diary of a Teenage Girl, which deals with uh, sexual abuse. So the, the character, her mother's boyfriend, is having a relationship with her, and she tries to, uh, giving her alcohol and all sorts of things, and she tries to get him to, to sort of humanize it by telling, she says, tell me about your parents. Like she says, you tell my mother things about yourself. She wants to humanize the relationship. Very moving, very tough book. Um, and she also um, has done other books by, about childhood and so on. Very different style, the great British uh, graphic novelist Posey Simmons, who's, who also is a children's book illustrator, and Simmons has done a number of adaptations, very, very adapted, very changed, um, from classics. So this is her version of Emma Bovary uh, called Gemma Bovary about a Sloan Ranger who goes off to France. And this page, I mean it's very typical, it's a very uh, vertical book as you can tell. Um, but the, the depth of this, so this is the host of the dinner and he's the narrator, so this is a narration block, right, and here's all the people sitting at the dinner. And then the whole of this section is Gemma's thought bubble of thinking about her meeting with her lover in the middle of the day, and then in the middle of that, he's thinking about his lover and another bubble inside the bubble and then the bubble closing at the end. I mean, the sort of levels of narration that she can get on a page and the complexity, um, of characterization and also just the quality of her art, which is exquisite. And she also did a reworking of Thomas Hardy's uh, Tess of the, not Tess of the D'Urbervilles, um, Far From the Matting Crowd, uh, which is called Tamara Drew. And here's Tamara and the, uh, the, f the nice farm guy who stands in for Oaks, I think his name is in the, in the original novel, which I haven't read for a very long time. Gorgeous, gorgeous art. Here's the American Carla Speed McNeil, who works in science fiction. This is from her very long series called Finder. This is the volume called Talisman, which is my favorite of the volumes I've read about a young girl who loves books <laughs> um, and, and finds a kind of escape uh, from uh, her life in it, um, in them. And this sort of mythic moment where she's imagining the character Marcia, imagining herself out in this uh, world where the the animal challenges to go into the water uh, where she finds that um, the, the, she's stepping on weapons as she walks out into the water and uh, is transformed into this warrior figure and she asks why the why the figure on the shore is is weeping is weeping because children have to grow up too soon and I can't conclude without at least mentioning the and it's not my expertise to really speak on uh, manga, but there are many, many women working in Japan doing great art, having sort of created the whole genre of shoujo manga uh, or women or girls manga. I just want to point out to uh, Moto Hagio because her work was so important in the founding of the genre and her work has been, a collection of her short pieces have been collected in English and published by Fantagraphics under the title A Drunken Dream and this is from her story Willow. Uh, the manga is unflipped so you read uh, from here um, going sideways, going the other way. Uh, and also Keiko Tobi, whose work uh, with the light um, 
a realistic representation of autism that won a lot of awards in Japan, became a popular television series, and really kind of opened up uh, a discussion about that illness. And very careful book, it's a work in th literally thousands of pages, uh, multi-volume, and very precise about sort of issues like here, uh, the mother is trying to explain to the child uh, what an x-ray will consist of. So you take off your clothes, the x-ray, you put your clothes back on, it's over. Um, these little sort of pictographs and so on that the mother uses and very much um, conveying the difficulty and complexity of this uh, parent-child relationship. So that gives you something of a sort of sweeping overview of some of the possibilities in women making comics um, and the wonderful range of artistry and storytelling and truth-telling.